go with some of the Frostbury State folks to um, to the 9/11 memorial for Flight 93 uh, this afternoon. Um, a little morbid, I'll do that. But it sure was uh, fascinating and uh, haunting all at the same time. Um, and in a strange way, uh, gets at what we are going to sort of talk about tonight, tomorrow morning. I remember the days after 9-11, and I realized that culturally speaking, this is now officially off your radar. Uh, yeah, I was five, what most people yeah. say. Uh, but for my generation, it really was one of those sort of scars across your history, where you remember exactly where you were, one of those kind of things. And so going there was very much fun. But I remember the, the discussion that followed uh, after the attacks happened, and Americans were reacting to this act of violence. And I remember over and over again, the people on the news uh, were referring, and I understand why they were doing it as much, they were referring to the terrorists as cowards. What a cowardly act to take the life of these people. And I understand exactly what they mean by that. But in a couple of conversations with some campus minister friends of mine, you know, whatever, 14, 15 years ago, it never happened. I remember somebody making the comment that, you know, you can call the act whatever you want, uh, and there's appropriate names for that kind of evil that perpetrates that kind of act against another human life. There's no question. Cowardice may not be the best word, simply because it was an act of extraordinary courage that it took for people to give up their life, their own life, and of course the lives of all the people on those planes, in the act that they did. Now, I'm not willing to call that courage, but it wasn't cowardice. It was because you had a group of people that were deeply committed in the most fundamental parts of who they were to a worldview that had space for that kind of act. Is that safe? I don't think I'm reading anyone's motives when I say that. But it illustrates something very powerful about the manner in which the human heart works that I want to look at tonight that has to do largely with what the Apostle Paul suggests to us is the most fundamental commitment of the Christian heart. That is that thing that is on the inside of a Christian that motivates fundamentally what their worldview is. And we get it from our passage tonight in 1 Timothy chapter 1. So if you brought a Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. Then I want to skip over and read another story from Luke so we can compare the two and sort of uh, grasp at this question. But what we have, mind you, is what I suggest to you this morning was the greatest Christian that ever lived, the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul begins in 1 Timothy. By the way, 1 and 2 Timothy were written much later in Paul's life, we believe. Uh, while he was in a Roman prison awaiting execution. So what you're getting from the Apostle Paul is a lifetime of reflection on how he views himself. What do you expect him to say? Hmm. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal and invisible, the only God, glory, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. When we go now to Luke chapter 7, Jesus encountered with the servant of a centurion. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. 
when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they, this is the religious leaders of his time, um, came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Again, the grass withers, the flowers fade and fall, but the word of our God lasts forever. It's been years that I've been sort of building on this idea of what it means. I'm trying to answer that young man's question that I don't know how to believe. The message from last night is drawn largely from a sermon preached years ago by Brian Chappell on the book of Daniel that deeply impacted me. This morning's material came from a guy by the name of Greg Bonson who died years ago uh, but did a lot of work on the question of the Christian worldview. Tonight, I draw very heavily, uh, most explicitly, from a sermon I heard about 15 years ago from uh, Tim Keller. Not a lot of surprise there among RUF guys, but this is one of those that sort of made its imprint on me in a very deep way, so I'm very indebted to what he had to say. But I simply want to entertain two questions tonight in this text. The first one is how did the Apostle Paul see himself? What was the manner in which he viewed him? And then secondly, what does that teach us about faith in the Christian life? Just those two questions. How did Paul see himself? And what does that tell us about faith? First of all, Paul says, when you think about himself, there's two fundamental things that define Paul's character and view of himself. The first one is, I am the worst sinner that there ever was. Did you catch that? If you were to take a collection of all the sinners out there, I'm at the top of that heap, or the bottom, whichever way you view it. Paul says he's the worst of sinners. Now, I love to sort of attempt to measure your reaction to those kind of statements. Isn't there a little part of you that's like, okay, all right, the Apostle Paul, we appreciate all that, but I'm just not buying that. You know, I found over the years that college students react in one of two ways. They either think on the one hand that this is that kind of typical, um, uh, like, pious exaggeration. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, where religious people have this tendency to sort of take on the like, oh, you know, I'm just more afflicted than thou. Um, oh, I'm such a horrible sinner. But there's nothing inside you that really believes what they're saying. It just seems like some kind of weird, creepy spiritual posturing. Is the Apostle Paul doing that? Is this like one of those like Christian things that you just say? Well, you might actually be tempted to believe that if this was the only time Paul said stuff like this. But I think there's actually a fairly good argument to be made in support of a quote by J.I. Packer, a famous Anglican Reformed preacher, who said that growth in grace, if the Apostle Paul is to be a measure, is actually growth downward. If you go early on in the Apostle Paul's ministry, he's talking about his role as an apostle, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And sort of in a throwaway moment, he says, even though I am the least of all the apostles. Huh. Least of the apostles? I don't know. It's a whole lot more ink spilled about him than the other apostle. Peter, maybe. I don't know. But Paul? Least? A little bit later on, he writes the book of Ephesians after his time in the city of Ephesus. And he's talking about the fact of even though he is the least of all the saints. The least of the saints? Now you're thinking that Paul has a problem. He's, he has low self-esteem. What's wrong with Paul? I'm not worried about Paul. You should see someone. You know, a little bit later on, you get him sort of in the book of Romans, where he's talking about the evil inside of him in chapter 7. And, and, and he goes, and he talks about the good that he's trying to do, that he doesn't do, but the evil things he's trying not to do, that's the stuff he keeps on doing. 
until finally he throws up his hands at the end of the chapter. He's like, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Now you're getting convinced of it. And then finally, towards the end of his life, he looks up and says, if I were to take a measure of where I am, I think that I'm the worst sinner that ever lived. What's going on? The Apostle Paul saw his life as becoming, as seeing his sin in greater and greater relief. It's no pious exaggeration. The second thing that I hear college students saying is, well, okay, maybe he's being honest, but this is what I hate about Christianity. Because Christianity is just morbid. You Christians are constantly in this posture of suggesting that I'm supposed to hate myself. I'm bad, I'm evil, I'm down on myself. And you know, it's been this way from the very beginning. There was actually a, uh, a second edition of the Confessions of St. Augustine. Are you just aware of this word? Augustine, the great sort of early church father, wrote a, a autobiography of his conversion to Christianity called the Confessions. And in this book, he talks about a very life-changing event that happened as a child where he went into an apple orchard and stole apples from this orchard. And he reflects on it later in life as being the first time that his conscience ever kind of weirded him out. Well, the book, in its new release, had a reviewer from the New York Times, and Keller pointed us in this direction, I went to look it up and found it, where the reviewer said something hilarious. And it goes like this. The viewer is talking about Augustine. He says, you know, child of a dominant mother, victim of a guilt-ridden conscience, Augustine writes the bewilderingly haunted confessions in which infantile peccadilloes, tiny sins, right? Like stealing apples and adolescent fumblings with instinctive sexuality are bewailed with all the anguish of a frustrated perfectionist. That's hilarious. Somebody in the 20th century looking back at Augustine being like, what a frustrated perfectionist he was. Okay, easy. Easy, Sigmund Freud. A few hundred years away from that day. Okay, job. But what does he say? He's just a victim of bad upbringing. That's what's going on. You're just a, you're just a, a, a set of circumstances away. It's this problem of how you grew up. And you Christians are always doing it. You're just too morbid. And Paul, what's interesting about the Apostle Paul, is he's saying the same thing but coming from a different direction. Did you notice the little list that he gave of the things that qualify him as being the worst of sinners? He says, first of all, he was a blasphemer. Secondly, he you know, persecuted Christians. That was bad. But then it says that he was an insolent opponent. What in the world is an insolent opponent? Well, you know, the, the, the Greek word behind that, those two words, insolent opponent, you may be aware of. It's the word hubristus, where we get the word hubris. You heard this in Greek, uh, Greek mythology? What is hubris? Hubris is a destructive pride. It's not just pride in your accomplishments that you sort of give yourself a pat on the back, but it's the kind of pat on the back that you take for yourself so that someone else will be destroyed in the process. You know what I'm saying? It's not just that I did good, but it's like, I did good and you stink. The word actually I heard one commentator translate said that Paul says that he was a trampler. <coughs> You see what he's saying? He's saying, look, there came a moment in my life where I realized that all of the good stuff that I was doing, and, and you would be hard-pressed to get as religious as the Apostle Paul. He said, I came to realize that the only reason why I was doing it is so that I could make myself look better in front of other people, and I took every chance that I could to trample them around me. Which strikes me as interesting. Because the Apostle Paul said, I was destructive in my actions. Everything I did was to feel superior to other people. What I needed was to make sure that I was better. It wasn't about the religious action. It was about looking better than other people. And the crazy thing is, Augustine is saying the exact same thing. Later on in the Confessions, <laughs> Augustine says, when I will to commit theft of the apples, I did so not because I was driven to it by any need. I stole something of which I had plenty of my own and of much better quality. I did it, listen, listen, listen. I did it because it was forbidden. I loved my sin, 
Not even what my sin held for me, but the sin. <laughs> this is it. This is, a, this is huge. He said, I didn't have any desire for apples. But as soon as my mother said, don't steal apples, something came up to me and was like, I don't need apples, but now I'm going to go get them. Because his need was not about apples. His need was to be the absolute sovereign ruler of his own life. And when the commandment came in, Augustine died. And he suddenly realized that there's something inside me that needs to be the absolute ruler of my life. And Paul is saying the exact same thing. This is totally weird. And in my opinion, it's one of the great contributions that Tim Keller has sort of given to this generation. Because Keller goes on to unpack the fact that here you have two different people. You know, here in the 1960s is Augustine, who is walking around with a sign that is arguing for sexual liberation. You know, you Christians are too small-minded. We need to be able to do whatever we want to with our bodies. Paul was the very strict moralist who would have had a sign in his hand protesting the fact of the other people. But what the Bible is saying, what I think Paul leads us into, is that for both of them, they're exactly the same. Y'all, there's two ways to run away from God. Most of us are very familiar with the irreligious path. You know, he went to college. Man, if you're not John, woo. I went to college, and man, I got to go crazy. That's the irreligious path to run away from God. But see, Paul is saying there is also a religious path to run away from God. That we can run away from Him simply by hoping that all of the good things that I'm doing are either commending me to God or at the very least making me look better than the people around me. The Bible is saying whether you're coming from an irreligious point of view or whether you're coming from a religious point of view, underneath it's all, it's the exact same thing. Look, here are two acorns. You put one acorn on a rocky, sort of shallow uh, dirt, and it dies and rots. You put another acorn somewhere in good soil, and you feed it, and you nurture it, you grow it over time, and it becomes a great big oak tree. The question is, one was small and little, the other was great and large, but which one had more potential inside of it when it started? You say, well, they were equal in potential. It was just environment. Exactly. The Bible goes to religious people and says, look, you may not have grown up to be, I don't know, like a Hitler or a Genghis Khan or something, but it's not because you lack the potential. The deep down on the inside, because your religious efforts were done to keep me out of your life, they actually give you nothing. And it probably up until this time more alienated you from the, from the irreligious people around you than brought you close. Okay, what that means is, is for many of us, a lot of times, even our religious activity, bear with me, I think this is just worth saying, even our religious activity of coming on, a, on an argument fault conference can be nothing more than a very sophisticated strategy that we're deploying in order to establish before God and others that I'm just better than you. You can go into ministry, by the way, with the same motive. You can become a ministry, you get ordained to be the gospel with the exact same thing, thinking, well, at least I was a minister. Oh, it's rampant. So Paul says, first of all, if you were to crawl up inside my head, you would find that there's a real life conviction that I am the worst sinner there ever was. If you unpack it that way, how with it. But secondly, and this is what is crazy, he says, but because I'm the worst, I'm the best. Buckle up, bear with me, don't, don't let this freak you out. Look, he says, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited power as an example. All right, underline that word example in your Bible. That's actually worth drawing in your Bible for. I think because the word example is not the best of translations. I always hate it when the preachers did this. Like, well, you know, really great. This is not a good translation. You're kind of like, oh, I can't trust my Bible, but I can trust you. Um, but bear with me. I've got a few people to back me up on this sort of thing. The word there is typically the word example is referring to uh, a type. That's the literal Greek word, a tupas. But that's actually not the word. The word there is a huper tupas or a hyper type. So it's not just that it's an example. Paul is saying that what we've got here is the ultimate example, like the hyper example, the best 
possible example, and this is what's crazy, when you read it the first time, you oftentimes think that he's talking about Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ came, and he was a great example to us. That's not how the grammar reads. The example that Paul is talking about, are you ready? Is himself. <laughs> you can get this together in your mind. Paul is like, I'm the worst possible sinner that I know. Every good thing I've ever done was to put each other down. But I'm also the best example of a Christian that you'll ever see. I'm a hyper example of a Christian. And we start to think, ah, okay, Paul, you told me that you were the worst, and that's pathological that you have a bad self-image. Now you're telling me you're the best, because, and that's pathological, now you're conceited. Which is it, Paul? Ah. Oh. My guess is, is if we can't put those two things together in our personality, it's because we do not yet understand the radical new flooring that the Christian gospel places you upon to base your entire personality. If you cannot bring together your fundamental rottenness from inside your heart, and yet at the same time the joy and release that comes from Jesus' grace, then the gospel has not arrived yet at the level of your personality. And Paul is trying to unpack the way in which he views the world. Because he's simply saying, look, if I can deal with my conscience, and I'll give him this one. I don't think anyone in the room has ever killed or persecuted a Christian. You might have made fun of a religious person at one time in your life, but I'm not sure you actually overseen their death. If you did, I don't know. It's an interesting crowd. <laughs> but Paul had done that very thing. What must it have been like for Paul to travel around all the cities he did on his missionary journeys? Wait, 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 wait. I know you. Paul, you used to be Saul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You threw my uncle in jail where he died. Oh, no, 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 no. I know your name, Paul. You're the one who actually had my sibling killed for his faith. Paul probably had some stuff to deal with. He needed to see a counselor. He could have gone on Oprah. <laughs> Is Oprah still a thing? I was like, who's Oprah? Okay. But in the core of who he sees, the way he sees the world, Paul has these two things that on the one hand say, I have no pride left in me, but because God worked in me so powerfully, there is not one person in this room who can say that they are out of the stretch of God's grace. That's a big deal. But Paul just finally explodes in verse 17 of 1 Timothy 1, doesn't he? It's almost like he's sinking through this thing, he's kind of freaking out about it, and suddenly he's just kind of like, ah! Now to the king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Why do we talk this way? <laughs> Because eventually it just welds up so beautifully inside of our souls that the only proper reaction is praise. Look, y'all, the central feature of Christianity, in many ways, I've kind of come to the core of the core of the core right now. If there's anything that this faith, this journey of understanding faith is going to take us to this point. Because you need to ask the question, how can that be less? How can it be that I am the worst, but that I'm the best? How do I hold those two together? Because I'm so insecure and so fearful, and yet you're trying to tell me that I'm treasured in love, that I'm more sinful and wretched and depraved than I could possibly imagine, but more loved and accepted and forgiven in Jesus than I could ever dare dream. How can that be? And here's the answer. You ready? Because Jesus became your worst. So that he can give you his best. That's it. <clears throat> this is why when you're reading through the Gospels, you're sort of speeding through this narrative of Jesus' teachings, all of which are vital to what he was about. It's all about Jesus' teaching and the buffoonery of his apostles. I'm not making that up. Go read them. Then all of a sudden you get to his crucifixion and the narrative just slows to a crawl. You're suddenly hearing hour by hour by hour why. Because those writers were going back and saying, something happened there. Something was going on there. There was a holy exchange that went on with, between our Lord and his Father. Where God raised him up and began to treat him at that moment as if he was me. 
So that on the cross, Jesus becomes all of the things that I have lifted up and placed upon myself as being reasons why he could never love me. And then he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which means that in that moment on the cross, what Jesus was doing was he was receiving and absorbing and in the end neutralizing the wrath of God for his people. That on the cross, the holy exchange was, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. That's it. That's the center. Because once you have that at the center and that becomes what radiates out from you, you suddenly discover what the Christian life is all about. And from my argument, you stumble upon the key of faith. Why? Because of my second point. I'll finish with this. We see what Paul thought about himself, but secondly, we see how this fits into our understanding of faith. Because in Luke chapter 7, we get this sort of, uh, this experience where Jesus is talking, you know, to this centurion's um, centurion about his servant. And the religious people go to Jesus. This is so perfect. <laughs> the religious people come up and like, Jesus, we now have a reason for you to come and work your miracles. We have a guy. He built our synagogue. I know he's a Gentile. But hey, he loves our people. He is totally worthy of doing this. Like, there's a lot of guys out there. But this guy really deserves it. And not a verse or two later, the centurion sends his servants to say, just the opposite. He's like, Jesus, don't even come. Because the more that I look at myself, the more I realize I am completely not worthy. But you know what? I kind of get this idea of authority. Because I tell people where to go and they kind of go. And I'll bet you that you have that same kind of power and the same sickness and healing. All you got to do is say the word. You have to come to my house. But let's establish the fact that I'm not coming here on the basis of my worthiness. And what does Jesus commend them? Jesus says, I have not yet seen such faith. There it is. This is it. This is, this is the weekend in a nutshell. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. The writer says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest from the house of God, let us draw near. Don't you want the kind of confidence that it's talking about in this passage? Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I'm not talking about baptism. Now, listen to verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Did you catch that? Hold it with faith because he who promised is faithful. That was big. Because the essence of faith that I believe Augustine is telling us about, that I think the Apostle Paul is telling us about, and the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us about, is that faith is not faith if it's about you. Rather, you never really discover true faith until you begin to despair of you. That is, the essence of Christian faith is looking away from oneself to the only thing that can truly be for me what I need. And that is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now we sing songs about his work. We sing songs about his character. In the end, faith feels like helplessness. Faith feels like brokenness. Faith feels like like a hungry man who has finally found something to eat. Faith feels like someone who has been parched and finally has found something to drink. In other words, all you need is need. There was a guy by the name of John Gershner who apparently started something like here, here, in this camp, in this town, who used to say this, all you need is need. All you need is nothing. If you try to bring something to Jesus, you got nothing. If you bring nothing, you get everything. 
Friends, that is the, that's the crazy upside down calculus of the gospel. It brings us the opposite. And to be honest with you, many of you grew up in religious traditions like I did, who were constantly being told how much your relationship to God depended upon you, depended upon your sincerity, depended upon your ability to repent, depended upon a thousand different things that even now you despair of when you think of it. And then the Apostle Paul leads us in to say, look, even your best deeds are like filthy rags. Your repentance needs to be repented of. But, come to me, and I'm the one who actually took care of that. Whether you've been running away from me with your irreligion, or whether you've been running away from me with your religion, you can come to me and finally find rest for your souls. It's both running away from me. But there's relief here. This is one of the reasons why my friend's question, I think, was so profound. My friend's question, I, I don't know how to believe came up when I was reading a little book by Horatius Bonner uh, called, um, called God's Way of Peace. You can actually find it for free now. It's public domain on Google Books or something. He says, look, if you're talking to someone and they say that they don't know how to believe in Christ because they don't know how to act in faith, but that what they really need is for God to give them some power to draw it forth, which I haven't found yet, you need to tell him that believing in Jesus is not a work, listen to this, but a resting on Christ. <laughs> and that this pretense is as unreasonable, listen to this, this is, this is, this is cool, it is as unreasonable as that if a man who is wearied with a journey and who is not able to go one step further should then suddenly start to argue, I am so tired that I am unable to lie down and rest. When, indeed, he can neither stand nor go. The poor, weary sinner can never believe on Jesus Christ until he finds that he can do nothing for himself. And then his first believing does always apply himself to Christ for salvation as a man hopeless and helpless in himself. You see what he's saying? He's saying to look and say, I don't know how to believe. Is to basically say, I wish that there were one last work that I could hoop, that, uh, one last hoop that I could jump through to get God on my side. If I could make myself believe and get this, you know, peaceful, easy feeling that you should have when you get religious like that, then I'll trust and live, give my life to Christ. And Bonner's looking and going, not that your self righteousness. You're actually saying until he does this. But when someone says, I'm walking through a desert. And I'm dying. And I can't take another step, but I'm too tired to lie down and rest. Father's going, the only qualification for lying down and resting is being tired. The only qualification for sitting down and eating is being hungry. And the only qualification for coming to Christ is if I feel my need of Him. Totally different thing to build your personality upon. But I'm going to introduce tomorrow's talk as I finish with this. In the center of your personality is this thing that the Bible calls a heart. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to fully reject this disconnect that people believe that they have between their heads and their hearts. Kind of a biblical way of speaking. We'll talk about it tomorrow morning. How about that for a teacher? But at the center of your personality is this thing called a heart. And what that heart does is it searches all of your life to look for something, to grab hold of. And say, this is what will make sense of my life. This is the thing that's going to sort of bring it all together. And throughout our lives, there's this constant despairing of one thing after the other that I look at and say, ah, oh, finally. I'm so much a better athlete than anybody in this room. Ah, oh, finally. Like, I'm really pretty, and she's not. Oh, you know what? I can take any of these people in this room to school with my grades. I'm going to get that scholarship. Oh, if I could just make my first million by the time I'm 30. Oh, if we could just conceive and have a child. I can have a family, and I can show my friends I'm not a, a screw up. Oh, if I could just make it to retirement not have work hanging over me. Oh, if I could just escape death and not have to face the very end of my life. 
Get the point? John Calvin said that human beings are idle factories that we crank them out at every single turn of our life. And the gospel forever is going to be going, oh, it's empty over there. It's going to waste you away over there. Come to me. Everybody who's weary and burdened, I'll give you rest for your souls. Something to think about. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you give us the grace to look away from ourselves and to you? Father, in many ways it feels counterintuitive to think about what it means to despair of ourselves and to lean on you. And some of us don't even know what that means. We are here. We've got enough troubles for someone between 18 and 22 years old should have. So we're looking to you. We're crying out to you. We're praying to you. We want to long to know you. We want to search for you. We're shocked and delighted and excited, though, at the thought that that might be the beginnings of faith. That we would come and seek you out, that we would find you. And that perhaps even some of them would find you for the first time. Maybe even today. Would you do that if you were there? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.